Now welcome to another edition of News from Naboo with Thor's Lightning Takes. And let's get right to the news. Breaking news. There's an imminent writer strike coming. Interesting. I had not uh, heard That's about that. Because it's imminent and breaking. Do tell the details. All right. We haven't had a writer strike since like 2017. I like that we got ominous thunder. Real ominous thunder when you said that. I told you this was scary stuff. We're under a tornado watch, but we don't care. We we don't. Nothing stops the news. The news doesn't rest. <laughs> uh, okay, that one in 2017 was averted, but right now, the Writers Guild of America, the WGA, are planning to stage a massive strike at the very beginning of next month. May 1st is the deadline that they have given, unless their demands are met. Their demands are monetary compensation for their weekly work. They want to be paid. Wow. God, they want a lot. Residuals for their released projects, pension support, health care, <laughs> and additional protection and support for professional standards. Hmm. Yes. Yesterday, members of the guild almost unanimously voted to authorize it. It was 97.5% voted for the strike. Oh, for the strike. For I was like, the okay. strike. I thought... The strike would only officially affect members of the WGA, but international writing groups in Canada and the United Kingdom have indicated they're going to show solidarity with the WGA by participating in the strike as well to put pressure on companies to agree to the demands of the writers. We, we actually... Do you remember it? We actually, like, lived through the last writer's <laughs> strike. I know it sounds <laughs> weird. It sound like it was this... Epic, no, it was terrible. It was event November fifth, two thousand and seven, and it lasted until February twelfth, two thousand eight. I do remember that. Yes. yes, remember the show Heroes was going on and just got oh, like that's lobotomized. Right. Yes. And series is like if you you look at like Netflix histories of shows that came out during that time, you find these like really suspiciously short seasons because the writer strike interrupted these shows and they put out these like subpar episodes. They put out what they had that they could shoot. But a lot of times it just, like, destroyed subplots that were going on. It also, like, affected some of the major movies at the time, like Transformers, Revenge of the Fallen. Oh, is that what happened Yeah, it was it? released with a subpar script. I think they're blaming it on the writer's strike, not just that they didn't care if they wrote a good movie, I guess. I don't know. Sorry. Have any of the Transformers movies been written <laughs> particularly well? But even entire projects were scrapped. There was uh, George Miller, the... Mad Max director, he was writing Justice League Mortal. It was canceled. That movie never came out because of the writer's strike. Interesting. Yes. A lot of companies, you know, have precautions in place just in case something like this should happen. Ever since, like backup I'm just saying, no, I'm just saying ever since Some scabs, the actual, as they called. well, that was a long strike. It was like, what, November to February? Like like, three, four months, yeah. Yeah, that was a long strike. Yeah. So companies have been taking more precautions, like Lucasfilm. So that in a worst case scenario, they can continue filming. Think about it. Their scripts are done for Skeleton Crew and or Acolyte. These things are done in their filming. So we've got a couple years worth of content to kind of absorb a blow that a strike would give. Yeah, like what are, we don't even know what they're writing right now. Like Because Mando season four is being written by Favreau and I think it's even done. And we don't know what else they're even writing right now. I know. It's still, it's something that smaller... Not small. It's something other studios are going to have to worry about. Things that put out yearly seasons oh, like, of yeah, shows like a, that aren't network usually television in advance. Stuff where they're cranking out like 20 episodes a season. Yeah, yeah things that are like soap operas, perhaps. Saturday Night Live. Things that base entirely on making jokes about current Cur events. Yeah. They get smacked with these types of scenarios. We do know it's rumored that Mando's fourth season script is done. So filming should happen regardless of the strike. Animated content, like the third and final season of The Bad Batch, also has had its script completed for some time. Well, then nothing else matters. I mean, no, Andor's no, no, no. being We're... filmed, that's all I need to know, right? The greater I'm concern kidding, yes. for the strike is the slate of the two films that are coming. The oh films that are coming. So they have an excuse for not making them. No, don't even. the whole <laughs> Yes, the whole Writers Guild went on strike so Just that Lucasfilm a... could not make a movie. I believe it. No. At this point... But two of the three films that were announced at Celebration would be stuck between a rock and a hard place. Stephen Knight, the replacement writer for Damon Lindoff, and Dave Filoni are both part of the WGA. Mm-hmm. See, it's all a conspiracy. Well, this would also possibly, depending on how long a 
strike when it could affect any Soka season two because he is required to go on strike with everybody else. He can't sit there and write anymore. He's got to stop. <laughs> I'm sure he can still write. No, you can't. I you mean, have to show solidarity to the group. No, but I mean, you can like write. You just don't tell people you're writing. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, Knight's script for the upcoming Ray Skywalker movie is said to be mostly complete. It was actually expected to be finished in the middle of May. So that mm. it could possibly get, yeah. Are yeah, the writers yeah. striking to prevent the Ray Skywalker no, movie? No, don't even. This way, they would, they would have an incomplete screenplay, and Filoni would well, have trouble working on his stuff. So there you go. You have to take the news seriously. I am. I'm actually taking this very seriously. It it's affects more than just Star Wars. Well, I mean, it affects actual real people too. I mean, it's yeah, one these thing are for people us with lives the... and jobs. Yeah, and exactly. Who apparently don't get enough in health care or pension or payment in general for their hard work. Yeah. mm Hmm. James Mangold's Dawn of the Jedi movie won't be affected because he's not Never a member of the he's not a member of the WGA, so okay. he could end up being the first one done if the others are oh, on strike. My goodness. Ah. Yeah. But that's all we really know right now about the strike. There's a good chance this will get resolved ahead of time, but unfortunately, no way to say for sure. Hmm. Interesting. We'll know on May first when they're all on strike and Saturday Night Live is like, we're taking a break because we uh, can't write any comedy. Is anybody going to miss it? I don't know. I don't think I've watched Saturday Night Live since the early 2000s it or so. It affects a lot of, like, nighttime talk, the talk shows yeah. and stuff, when all of their yeah. writers are gone, and they're like, eh. Eh. Oh, well, you're really not funny, but we already kind of knew that. Nah, so, there was, I mean, <laughs> TV during that last time period, I if you go back this. and watch it, it was kind of rough at times yeah i remember was, I, I mean i don't watch it i haven't watched a ton of tv probably since i was like a kid or a teenager but i, I do remember remember that i'm more of a reader and a, and a video game player than i am hmm. a tv watcher well, let's if i move, watch i'm watching tv i'm watching sports most of the time well let's move into something a little more lighthearted. the Andor season one cast teased where their characters are heading for season two all right Andor news i know you like your Andor news i do yeah, they were doing interviews with Screen Rant, continuing to, of course, praise the show, praise the writing. Tony Gilroy, you know, you know he's at least he's, he's shooting. They're filming now. So yeah, they don't need you have to, to, be... to worry about the script. <laughs> it's all good. He would have to stop. Yeah. Diego Luna kind of kicked things off, saying that Andor has now joined the Rebellion. He's done it for good. There's no backpedaling on his decision in season two. He's not going to be like, oh, I'm going to back out of the Rebellion. No, he's in. So don't worry about that. They're not going to make him a wishy-washy character at the... Last well, that minute. would make sense. He's pretty hardcore, and mm -hmm. he has a reason to be hardcore, which is what the season one was kind but of about. Also means there's some exciting moments ahead of him as he's trying to integrate into this new structure. I mean, he's kind of been a solo renegade, do what he wants for well, himself. We don't really see the Rebel Alliance. I mean, not that the Rebel Alliance forms until after Rogue One. Anyway, no, but there's real, definitely but, structure. Yeah, but we don't really see any of the actual structure in season one of Andor. Well, what Diego Luna described it as... He's ready to join, but he doesn't know what he's getting into. He doesn't speak the language. He has to learn a new language. He has to understand many things. He has to witness and meet some people that are going to be crucial in shaping him to become the man that's willing to sacrifice everything for the rebellion. There's still a lot that needs to happen, and it's going to be exciting. The structure is quite cool. It's four blocks. Each block is one year. But between each block, there's just time. It'll be challenging for the audience in a good way. And maybe it'll be exciting and different from season one. I wonder if they would ever take those missing oh, stories yeah, and, and fill put them in with somewhere comics in a book. or books. Preferably books over comics. Usually mm. the comics are kind of not what? as good, we'll say. Especially with this kind of writing. I think you're going to lose something mm. if you try to adapt this to a comic book. Unless Tony Gilroy writes it. And then it'll just be a book. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Let's move on to Mon Mothma, played by Genevieve O'Reilly. Her character in the first season had a very specific arc. Season two is going to show us how she kind of steps into being a leader. It's by stepping out of being a mother and a wife, I think. And here's, here's what she said. Let's just talk about what she said before you ramble off. Uh, that was I think in season one, we set her up. You understand that world. I think in season two, Tony really digs into what the cost of her choices is, what it costs for her in particular with her ideals to have to navigate the Empire, not just at work, but at home as well. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. Something's going down with that family. We know, because in They're Rebels, we see her escape in Rebels. There was an episode Without in Rebels them, that yes. literally is her escaping the planet after making her formal declaration about the Empire being bad. Yep. And, and she escapes alone. No parent? No daughter? No, we don't know what happened to him. Nope. It's kind of frightening. Let's get into your boy, 
Cyril Karn, Kyle Soler, <laughs> KS and SK. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. We also can confirm he's still eating cereal. So, he you know, said that, didn't he? Yeah. It, it's in one of the totally we didn't see the bad version of the trailer. Oh, that's right. Images yeah, that no, he's sitting totally at the didn't. breakfast table with his mom again. Eating cereal. But he kind of had a few things to say. He says, season two, I mean, it pops off in season two. They've turned it up to 11. What can I say? Where you leave Cyril in season one is in that little Star Wars cover with Deidre in the middle of the riot. There's so much potential from that moment. They both want the same. They both want Cassian. And they both realize they can be stronger together. There can be some union involved here, but they don't know what it is. You've got all these little time jumps in season two. There's a year gap before we start. Then there's three more because we've got to get to the beginning of Rogue One. And as a result, there's all these incredible moments happening. I've always thought of Cyril as an adolescent in terms of who he is. He doesn't really know who he is, actually. In season two, he finds out what his truth is, and he knows how to get what he wants. And it kicks off, man. It kicks off. With Deidre and Cyril, it's <sighs> happening. My oh. dream boat. My first ship. Now, he added that we're going to see a lot of her in Cyril in Season 2. I bet you he's going to see a lot of her, too. But we also get to see some alone time with his character. He said, yeah, there's a section where you find Cyril on his own, and it's in a very, very, very different way from Season 1. I think in the time jumps, there's just like a cliffhanger from where he's going and what's going to happen near the end of Season 1. Who's this Dedra person? There's something going on there. I really wanted to find out whether he was going to move out of his mom's house and... <laughs> <laughs> then what's going to happen with Dedra? And you get answers to both those things. Oh, I love them. Also, we know Bix Kayleen is back, and she didn't leave off in a very good spot. But Adriana Arjone had this to say. It really set her up in a loop. I think Bix, from the second you meet her in the end of the season, is a very different woman. I think she's really gone through it. And towards the end, what does that mean for season two? For me, there are all the questions the second I wrapped the show. Does this make her vengeful? Does this make her weak? Is she going to step down because she's afraid now? Is this going to affect her psychologically? How is she going to get over this? It was all these questions and Tony was like, you've got to relax. I will get there. Because her journey in this next season is pretty powerful. Hmm. Interesting. We're not done with Bix Kayleen. Which is interesting because she kind of felt like a character that may have been done with the, you know, mm -hmm. the trauma, mental trauma. And we know that, uh, of course, Andy Serkis was there, and he just kind of talked about season one stuff. Things we've already talked about, his official backstory, because he's calling it his official backstory, whether it really is or not. But if you've not heard it before, the backstory of Kino Loy is that he was once a worker, a union representative. He was very powerful, he galvanized the people, so authorities saw him as a bit of a threat, and they incarcerated him on Narkia 5. Was this the Writers Guild, by chance? <laughs> And it completely went against his principles, so he just wanted to survive. He just slugged it through day by day, didn't care anymore, because he just wanted to get home. He just wanted to get back out. And then he meets Cassian, who kind of reignites his spirit and brings him back to himself. He sees himself in Cassian, and it enables him to do that self-sacrifice and really inspire everybody else and do the right thing. And Andy Serkis says he loved playing every second of it. And we loved every second of it, too. Mm -hmm. Or at least I did. All right, well, I guess that's going to be all we got for you this time. So now it's your turn to take to the comments below and tell us what you think of any and all of today's news. And let's talk some Star Wars. And until next time, thanks for watching.